Hey everybody! Uh, this is going to be a, our first video for Unit 4, which is all going to be about Earth systems and resources. And this unit is kind of like a hodgepodge of different topics related to Earth science. We'll talk about tectonic plates, and we'll talk about soil, we'll talk about the atmosphere, we'll talk about the ocean, we'll talk about weather and seasons and climate. So uh, it's all going to be seem like it might be disconnected, but it is all connected. Um, and it's going to have big impacts on uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about later in the year, uh, everything from air pollution to farming. Uh, so uh, today we're going to start by talking about uh, focusing mostly on geology. And a little bit later we'll look at things like soil, uh, wind and atmosphere, and like I said, earth season. So let's start by talking about plate tectonics. Uh, you've probably learned about these before in like fifth grade earth science or whatever. Um, but we're going to dive into a little bit more detail today. So first of all, it's important for you to know that um, the great philosopher Shrek once said, ogres are like onions, they have layers. And uh, what I think we all know deep down that it's really a metaphor talking about the layers of the earth, uh, right? So it's, the point is, earth has layers, right? Just like an onion, just like ogres. Um, it has an inner core, an outer core, a mantle, and a crust. We live on the crust, and you can see the crust is the thinnest part. Um, and if we zoom in on that crust, we can see the crust has a couple layers itself. Um, the lithosphere is the very, very top of the crust, and the very, very top of the lithos lithosphere is going to be soil, where we grow our plants and stuff. Um, you can see that the water, the ocean, doesn't penetrate very deep down. So although 75% of Earth's surface is covered by water, only about 0.02% of Earth itself is actually water, because most of it is um, molten iron and stuff like that. Um, anyway, it's important for you to understand that the Earth has layers because uh, the top layer, the lithosphere, the crust, is actually broken up into these things called tectonic plates. And you can see a map of the world here, and you can see the continents, and each different colored area is a different tectonic plate. And they've all got interesting names. Um, this is the Pacific Plate, the Cocos Plate, Caribbean Plate, the North American Plate, the Scotia Plate, um, the Arabian Plate, Eurasian Plate, right? So they've all got um, neat names, um, slightly different than uh, the actual continents themselves. Uh, and these plates are going to move around. They've been moving around, and that's uh, the reason for the theory of Pangaea, where all of these continents were actually together at one point. Uh, but over the hundreds of millions of years, these, con these tectonic plates have shifted, uh, and so the continents on top of them have shifted. And where two plates meet... Uh, that, that line there is what we call a plate boundary. And there are three types of plate boundaries. There are convergent boundaries, where the two plates are coming together, like you can see here. There are divergent boundaries, where the two plates are spreading apart, like you can see here. And there are transform boundaries, where two plates slide past each other, which you can see here. And these plate boundaries can be in the ocean, or they can occur on land. Um, there are some examples here, like in the Himalayas, right? Um, and so they're actually um, a variety of different uh, outcomes of these plates. Uh, first, let's talk about convergent plates, where two plates smash together. Um, and these can lead to earthquakes, volcanoes, and mountain range formings. Um, one of two things is going to happen when two plates collide. Uh, either there's going to be a subduction, um, where the, uh, one plate that is slightly denser than the other will sink beneath the other plate, and as it sends toward the end of the Earth, so as it ascends towards the center of the Earth, it will heat up and melt into magma, which will rise and form a volcano. That's um, a subduction. Uh, or uh, the two plates can smash together and rise up and form a uh, mountain range. And you can kind of see that, right? Look, this is where the Himalayas are, and this is a convergent plate boundary. This is where we're going to see a lot of um, uh, mountains, right? The Himalayas. Uh, but also, if we look... Uh, over here um, in New Zealand, um, there are some uh, earthquakes that can happen there uh, oftentimes, and there are also uh, some volcanoes in that area, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, like I said, uh, this is the same image of a, of a con um, convergent plate, where the denser plate uh, is sinking below the lith lithosphere into the asthenosphere. It's going to melt into magma, rise to the surface, and be erupted as lava. Um, the only difference between magma and lava is lava is above ground, magma is below ground. 
Uh, here's another picture showing those two things, right? They can smash together and form a mountain range, or they can uh, smash together and one goes below and, and melts into magma. Uh, so uh, although lava is very terrifying, it's actually not that dangerous because it moves pretty slow. So it's pretty easy to avoid, to be honest. But it's not so much the lava from volcanoes that we want to worry about, but the ash. Small bits of rock, sediment, particulate matter floating in the air um, can uh, be extremely da dangerous to breathe, first of all. Uh, they can lead to collapsed roofs. They can sort of like petrify people, like at Pompeii. Um, and they can, um, they can block out the sun and cool the climate dramatically, um, which is similar to what happened, but potentially meant that dinosaurs uh, led them to their extinction when an asteroid hit and sent a bunch of ash into the air. Uh, the second type of plate boundary is a div divergent plate boundary, and this is when two plates are pulling apart from each other. Uh, and this can also lead to the formation of volcanoes if magma seeps up from beneath. It can form valleys and rifts. It can also lead to earthquakes, and it can lead to a phenomenon known as sea floor spreading, which is exactly what it sounds like, where because they're spreading apart, magma rises up, it cools immediately when it hits the water, um, and, and creates... Um, new seafloor, so to speak. So the seafloor actually is spreading and getting larger. Uh, here's another diagram showing the same thing. Um, yeah. Uh, here's an example of a divergent plate boundary where we've got a lot of uh, valleys forming. Um, and you can see some seafloor spreading going on here um, and some uh, uh, land sort of being torn apart over hundreds of millions of years to form uh, valleys. Um, Yep. Uh, and the last boundary is a transform plate boundary. This is when two plates will slide past one another, um, kind of like two cars sideswiping each other. And this can lead to tsunamis and earthquakes. Uh, the area where they slip by each other is referred to as a slip, slip, oh gosh, strike, slip, fault. Say that 10 times fast. Um, and these can lead to earthquakes. Um, you might be wondering, well, or you might know what an earthquake is, but um, it's also uh, important that you know where they come from. I hope you appreciate my joke here. I thought it was very clever. That's the Quaker Oats guy. Okay, once you're done laughing, you can continue on with the video. I'm sure you're all very laughing, laughing very hard right now. All right, so uh, at, at a plate boundary, specifically at a transform plate boundary, these plates can lock together. They're, they're sliding past each other, but if, if friction builds up, if they get locked together, um, they will uh, start to build up pressure and build up potential energy over time, right? But eventually, they're going to suddenly unlock, and they're going to slide past each other really rapidly. And this rapid release of energy is an earthquake. Um, and that's going to lead to a lot of dramatic impacts. You know, I've never experienced one myself, uh, but I know people who have. It's very scary. The whole world seems like it's shaking, um, and they, they can be extremely dangerous, especially if you're indoors. Uh, and here's some pictures. This is from uh, the San Andreas Fault. Uh, you can see the uh, fault line is marked with a dotted line here, and you can actually see that the fence on this person's farm was shifted over a couple of meters. Uh, because of the shift in the tectonic plates. And you can see the same thing in a 2010 earthquake in New Zealand uh, where the, uh, the slip strike fault uh, actually resulted in these train tracks being bent, which is kind of a, um, a uh, pretty telling picture. Uh, it's pretty crazy to look at. Uh, when an earthquake happens underwater in the ocean, uh, the earthquake is going to release a lot of energy, and if, if one piece of uh, the tectonic plate shifts upward, it's going to rapidly displace a large amount of water, and that water is going to form a wave, and it will start small, but over time, as it travels away from the epicenter of the earthquake, from where the earthquake started, it's going to build up momentum and gather more water and become a larger, larger uh, wave, and that's what we call a tsunami, right? Um, and one of the last things I want to talk about are uh, hot spots. These are things that they don't occur necessarily at a plate boundary. Uh, they're just areas where certain uh, segments of the magma underneath the lithosphere are particularly hot and rise to the surface. Uh, so the mantle is particularly hot, but what's interesting uh, is that as it melts through to the crust, it'll form a volcano. But remember that the magma underneath is staying relatively still, but the tectonic plates, the crust, is going to shift. Uh, so as the plate is shifting across the sort of sliding over the, the inner core of the earth, right, the hot spot's going to stay where it is, but the core or the crust above it is going to slide around. So the, it will result in these um, 
successive volcanoes being formed uh, that they call island arcs. Hawaii is a great example. Um, other archipelagos um, near the Philippines or off the coast of Japan. Um, and what happens is the, the current active volcano is the youngest, and as you move away from that, it, the islands become older and older. Um, I'll show you a demonstration in class that can um, help visualize this a little bit. Um, and that results in the development of archipelagos and island arcs. Here's another example off the coast of Japan leading towards Taiwan, right? The, the crust, the tectonic plate is shifting, but underneath um, the crust is a hot spot that is not shifting. So as, it, as, it, as the crust shifts across the hot spot, the, it almost looks like these islands are moving. Um, all right, and if we take a look back at this uh, map of plate boundaries, and we look at the different type of plate boundaries. Uh, this represents a divergent boundary. A transform boundary is just a solid line, and a line with triangles on it is a convergent boundary. We can use this to predict where earthquakes might or might not happen, right? Like in California on the San Andreas Fault. Um, we can use it to predict where mountain ranges might or might not be, like with the Himalayas. We can use it to predict the likelihood of tsunamis forming and the likelihood of volcanoes forming, right? Iceland is up here. There's a divergent plate boundary there. We see lots of uh, volcanoes in Iceland, even though it's so far north and there's uh, lots of glaciers there. So that, that's part of the reason why. Um, and one of the interesting phenomena that we see is if we look at the plate boundaries uh, off the west coast of the United States and the east coast of Asia, um, we see this phenomenon where there are a lot of volcanoes and a lot of earthquakes happening. So they call this the Ring of Fire, um, which is a, kind of a neat phenomenon where there are all these volcanoes in this, in this ring shape. It's not really a ring. I didn't come up with a name. Okay, If I came up with it, I would have come up with something much more creative. I think it kind of looks like a T-Rex. This is the eye, and that's like the, the mouth is like here. Um, if you see it, it's because you're a genius like me. Um, so uh, that's just kind of a, a cool phenomenon. We'll do a practice FRQ that looks at the Ring of Fire. Um, all right, and the last thing I want to talk about, kind of unrelated to tectonic plates, but um, somewhat related, uh, is the rock cycle. Um, you don't really need to know too much about this. You should know that, uh, whoops, that igneous rock comes from cooled magma. So igneous rock is going to be found a lot uh, near areas of volcano or volcanic activity or hot spots. That's like a very porous rock. Um, looks like a sponge almost. Um, rock over time can weather away, whether it's igneous, metamorphic, or sedimentary, can weather, get broken down by wind and rain into sediments, little tiny pieces and flecks of rock. And over time, those will get compacted and cemented together uh, into sedimentary rock. Uh, this happens on the Earth's surface, not very deep down, um, and most fossil fuels, uh, coal, oil, and natural gas are sedimentary rock. That's the most important piece that you should take away. Uh, and then over time, sedimentary rock will, will get buried under many, many layers of rock. It will, uh, lots of pressure, lots of heat, and very much, much deeper down, it will uh, turn into metamorphic rock. It might shift, uh, it, it, it might um, twist and turn and get all morphed together. Uh, and uh, that is going to be actually the hardest type of rock that there is. Um, I guess igneous rock can also be um, turned into metamorphic rock as well. You don't really need to know a whole lot about this, but I want you to be aware of weathering and erosion. I want you to know that igneous rock indicates volcanic activity, and I want you to know that sedimentary rock is uh, where most fossil fuels are found. Okay, uh, that's all I got for you for today. Uh, and this kicks off our discussion of Unit 4, and next time we'll be talking about soil. So if you've got questions, bring them to class, and I will see you then.